everyone and welcome to the video where I talk about my thoughts and honest opinions on what I just played, which was, of course, Jurassic World Evolution 2, the second. Thanks to Frontier for allowing me access to uh, play this development build of the game because that's what it was. Of course, it was not finished. Uh, and then, of course, I've still got a lot of things to change. And a lot of things I'm going to discuss is uh, critiques or maybe possible improvements that I think Frontier could make to the game in order to make it a better experience. Um, so I've done a, a little list here. So we're going we're gonna to jump straight into it. What is my first impressions of Jurassic World Evolution 2? Uh, well, go before going into it, I was a little bit hesitant. Uh, from everything that I'd seen of Jurassic World Evolution 2, it just felt like evolution, but better. Like, things that were implemented by mods or later DLCs that made the game just a better experience, but this time, it was in there from the start. But actually, after playing the game, uh, there's a lot more micromanaging that comes around, uh, or comes into the gameplay. Some for the better, some for the worse, and we're gonna get into that. First thing we're gonna talk about, I played two of the campaign, or two, two modes, I should say. Go watch them! They're up there somewhere! I don't know. Go check it out. Had loads of fun. So we'll talk about the campaign mode. Uh, a lot of the, the Jurassic World Evolution OG cast, like the originals from that game that never existed in the Jurassic World franchise beforehand, come back, as well as Cabot Finch. Um, and you take control of, or you try to rebuild a, a poacher lair that was uh, went wrong and apparently everyone died. Um, but allowed us to have some look at uh, the Conotaurus there and some interactions that they did. Um, and a new feature that they're kind of trying to implement, I think, and it's it's, uh, there was a lot more in the uh, challenge mode, so I'm not going to stay too long on that campaign mode. But if we look at the menu, there seems to be two dinosaurs um, that I was like, hold on, what, what are those? I don't recognize those. One's a pteranodon and one is an actual dinosaur. Um, the one that's a theropod I didn't really recognize, so maybe that's a new species that we haven't seen before. Um, and the other one being what originally I thought was a Jurassic World pteranodon skin. The, sorry, the Lost World pteranodon. I think I said Jurassic World, didn't I? The Lost World pteranodon. Um, that one being the blue and beigey looking uh, pteranodon that's at the end of the movie, which we never really see, but we're supposed to be play a bigger role with the helicopter like attack scene which was later implemented into Jurassic World with Masrani's death. <laughs> Spoilers I know but it could even just be an entirely new species then but I'm, we're going to talk more on the um, the challenge mode and everything that I sort of discovered because that was basically free roam mode sandbox mode except for you you know you've got to do things. The biggest thing to note we'll start with our category buildings buildings and enclosures yes so the biggest change um, with this was or one of the biggest changes was the way enclosures are made. Now, if you remember when it came to Jurassic World Evolution, everything was instantaneous. Uh, you didn't really have to try to contain a dinosaur because you could just put uh, fences around it and stop whatever it was doing in its tracks instantly. However, now when you place fences, that isn't the case. They slowly build segment at segment or segment after segment after a time, which could leave some, some, some touch and go uh, situations and also allows for the dinosaurs, which we'll get into further, unique animations to maybe adapt to changes over time rather than instant. Because if you wanted to stop a battle, all you had to do was place a fence between the two dinosaurs and that was it. Those dinosaurs would no longer battle. I think instead of space bar to curve paths and fences, now it's shift. Whether or not that'll actually stay, I'm not too sure. I'm not really fussed about that. One thing I did want to mention, uh, of course, you got the, the building snap to paths, which is what we've come to expect, I think, in Jurassic World Evolution. It was there, but it's here now. Uh, but the viewing platforms don't snap to paths. They snap to fences, but they don't snap to paths. So you, you have to, you're still in this awkward phase where you kind of have to build the paddock first and then build the path around it. You can't go the other way because if you build a fence right next to the path, there's no way a viewing platform is going to fit there. So you kind of have to go in the awkward phase of deleting the fence and then putting the path, the viewing platform there and then redoing it. A little bit awkward, but uh, it's nothing that we haven't come to expect from Jurassic World Evolution. Uh, when it comes to making those bad boys, it's actually a lot easier. Frontier has made it way easier to make fences that are just... Um, satisfying to build, you know, with the, the snapping connections. Normally, with Jurassic World Evolution, you had to make, like, a little bit of fence and then kind of, like, make another little bit of fence and then go to the angle from that to make, like, a perfect sort of square sort of thing. Whereas now, uh, when you're making a fence, you get guidelines and snaps. So you know exactly when you're extruding out a fence where the edge of the hatchery is. So you'll be able to stop there and then instantly make a right angle straight to the hatchery, which is so much more appreciated. I don't know why that wasn't there. Um, um, one of the newest kind of buildings that 
kind of serves a purpose and doesn't at the moment, or from what I've seen, what I got to play, uh, is the backup generators. So I think a problem with Jurassic World Evolution was, you know, a storm would come, it would hit the power uh, generator or like the actual power plant thing, whatever you want to call it, and all power to the park or whatever it was supplying would be gone. Um, this could be negated by certain things where you just have more power plants supplying all over the place, of course, at detriment to your park space. Uh, however, now you have um, backup generators, which you can also fill uh, with your Jeeps that are dotted around the place. Um, and, they, and they're not supplied by power lines or anything like that. Basically, anything that is in within a certain vicinity of this backup generator is supplied by it. Um, and of course, you have to pay to replenish the backup generator. That's what I'm trying to say. Uh, it's quite interesting. I'd love to see how further on going, how that's going to work. But didn't really get to see too much of that. But I do want to say uh, uh, the biggest thing uh, with buildings and the way you play, uh, you have veterinary buildings. So you, usually you would have your Jeep and the old one go in and dart a dinosaur to make it, you know, healthier and better. Whereas now, if it, maybe if a dinosaur is captured from the wild or if it's went into a battle, you need to scan it with a big, you know, it's, it's very reminiscent of Jurassic World or the Lego Jurassic World set, where it's like the ambulance uh, thing. You need to go into the enclosure, scan the dinosaur, and then sedate it, uh, transport it to the medical facility where the problem will be identified and I think fixed. I can't remember, I don't remember fixing Fixing it. I think it was fixed there. Totally new building um, at the moment. And speaking of differences in buildings, uh, the research, uh, or should I say the genetic and the fossil extraction research uh, has changed. So normally you would have about four or five slots and you could uh, you know, you know, research more. That's kind of there. Um, however, what it used to be is just a single, like an amber or a fossil would be this, it would take up the same amount of slot, it would take up one slot. Whereas now, Depending on what it is, it takes up multiple slots, which led to a little bit of confusion confusion when I first played this, because I was like, what? I don't get this. How does this how does this work? I don't see what's happening and why can't I select that? So maybe they need to make that a little bit clearer. Maybe that's just me. I don't know. Um, but obviously, I think you can unlock uh, more slots in future. Uh, just something to be aware of that that kind of has changed. And also, you can't just sell minerals or gold and stuff like that you kind of need to research them as well uh, which makes um, when the fossil teams come back uh, a little bit slower because not only you know it's not instant money it's like oh they come back oh I can sell that no they come back you not only have to put it in and take up more slots and take time uh, you have to assign researchers to do so and researchers oh that's a whole load of topic Bear with me one second before we get there, because I want to talk about the genetics, um, because this is one of the biggest parts of playing the game, is genetically modifying your dinosaurs. Um, and before, you would have a skin node, and you would select from a, you know, predetermined Tygia, Savannah, all that jazz, dinosaur skins. Uh, and you wouldn't know what they look like, because it would just show you the colors that might be there, and that would be it. However, now you get two categories for the skins. You get a sort of a base skin, and then you get a pattern. So you get to see what the, it will look on the dinosaur, which is oh so great. I mean, it's not, it's Far Cry from what we really wanted, which was, you know, like you'd get to see the uh, the actual dinosaur side profile, and you'd see the color switchings. Some guy on YouTube has actually made a really good tutorial, like videos on the dinosaurs, like a species field guide, except for way better than what the Frontier made to an extent. It's just, it's a lot easier uh, that you can actually see what the dinosaur looks like beforehand and it tells you, you know, to unlock things you have to do missions and stuff like that, certain skins. Uh, but the biggest change uh, not, well, that's not the biggest change, is the way genetics are handled. So before you would have maybe an attack or a social or something like that not even really, it was just kind of like the claw symbol or something. And you could increase the attack and it would also increase resistance, uh, immunity st you know, stuff like that um, it wouldn't really make too much of a difference what you would focus on is defense and attack and that would make you know whether the dinosaur was would win a battle or not that was basically immunity i mean i think anyone who's played Jurassic world evolution as long as i have dinosaurs get sick i don't really notice a specific difference if they had more immunity or not or longevity you know sort of thing like that but now you have health social and combat up at the top right 
um, which is just much better. I mean, I didn't really get to play with that too much because I, I, I focused on, you know, certain dinosaurs and aquatics because I'm like, we need to see those. If uh, playing Jurassic Park games over the past, God, six years, seven years now has taught me anything is that aquatics is what people want to see and uh, Cenozoics kind of play a, a close second fiddle. Um, but something that's really cool, I can't wait to see how that goes. Speaking of genetics and the dinosaurs themselves, incubation has changed. For the better, I will say, I don't think there's anything here negative to say about the way incubation works. Now, if you remember Jurassic World Evolution, you had a certain slot, maybe five or six, I think it was, and you would have one dinosaur per egg and you'd have to release, 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 release in order and it'd be like one, two, it would take a long time to release dinosaurs. Now you can actually get them in a clutch, almost, and you can select how many you want to um, gestate from those eggs, I think that is, or grow. You know, words, the scientific words. Uh, and so you can have one dinosaur or you can have four dinosaurs if that allows. Now, depending on the eggs, uh, especially when I made the Nozudoceratops, they had certain traits. One of them, which was really cool, uh, was that it showed zero aggress aggression to guests and Jeep vehicles. So, you know, you want to scan your dinosaurs. That dinosaur will not attack it, and if it breaks out, it's not a threat to guests either. Which also leads to an interesting thing that, can you have dinosaurs in like a sort of park area? A bit like you have with JPOG, you know, if a, if a guest felt they were secure enough, then they could have dinosaurs walk across that path if they were little herbivores. That's something really cool to think about. Frontier, if you want to do that, yeah, that's really good. Do, yeah, do that. The other ones, you know, like 30% more aggressive or less social, stuff like that. Uh, but the fact that you can release multiple uh, dinosaurs, so in one hatchery, you can have 20 dinosaurs released within all the slots is brilliant and just allows, you know, instead of making multiple hatcheries, you can kind of just have one and then transport them uh, there on after. Now, speaking of dinosaurs and looking after them, let's talk about the ranger teams. The ranger teams have uh, completely changed. They've actually made it a lot easier. Uh, so the jeeps go in, they're the ones that check on the dinosaurs. Now you have a specific building, it's like a ranger sentinel thing. It's like a, you know, it sort of surveys the dinosaurs. Um, and it's how you actually keep tabs on your dinosaurs. Uh, something that wouldn't happen in Jurassic World Evolution is that your dinosaurs needs change depending on what dinosaurs they're sort of bunking with. Um, or they live with, or uh, if certain things, uh, more environment or environmental changes happen. And the way to keep on top of this is by putting a, like a, a tower uh, inside the enclosure, or near the enclosure, I think. It doesn't have to be inside, as long as it's covered. Um, that the jeeps can now make, uh, you can make a route so they go to one, to the other, to the other. Uh, so they're constantly being moved around the park, which is great. They're not sat idling, waiting for you to go, oh, does something need to be vaccinated? All right, all right, I'll go. They're actually doing jobs, which is really cool. So, you know, you might be thinking, oh, I need to vaccinate that guy. Oh, well, the Jeep's already there. Brilliant, that's great. Instead of just going, I'll send a flare there because I'll need him in a second. However, now the helicopter or the, the sort of ranger team, I guess you could call it, uh, is how you dart dinosaurs and sedate them. Um, and what you would have to do is normally you would, especially to transport them, you have to go into the ranger thing, click transport, then click a move. Now it's a button on the left of the Yay! main screen. So moving dinosaurs is a lot more easier. And I, I can't be more grateful for that. They've really sped up that process. However, speaking of speeding up processes, P is still not packed in Jurassic World Evolution 2. And I don't know what their aversion is to it. It'd be so easy to have a hotkey just to go path. And I don't know whether this is just because that, you know, they're making for consoles as well. And P isn't something that's on the Xbox controller, even though you have all the letters. Uh, but P isn't one of them. Um, uh, so I can kind of understand that. But it would be really nice just, you know, to have that ability to easy do that. Now on to the biggest change. Again, I'm pretty sure he said that about five times already. Everything in the game is affected by this. Researchers. Oh, what a interesting and also headache-inducing update this is. So in order to do pretty much anything, you need to have researchers. You have researchers to research research. You have researchers to make dinosaurs. You have researchers go to dig sites and dig up dinosaurs. Anything you can think of that you want to do in this park, except for anything the rangers and stuff do, 
uh, researchers need to do. Now, this isn't too bad. It's all right. Researchers on a base level have a salary, an experience, um, and a perk. So maybe they, they're cheaper to, you know, to the, the salaries down, or they work longer on projects, or they're better at doing genetic -y things. They also have stat bars. So they have a logistics stat, they have a genetic stack, uh, stat, and they have a welfare stat. Um, now, all of these things come into play depending on what the scientist or researcher is doing. So they might be a generalist and they're kind of good at everything. But really, you just kind of want a balance. Depending on what you're researching, you might need to assign multiple researchers to a job, which means that they're kind of hanging back and you can't really do anything else because all your researchers are preoccupied. So there's this kind of juggle in your head of how to use your researchers the best way possible, which is interesting. But at the same time it's just an it feels like another headache in Jurassic World Evolution you know even in this one Jurassic World Evolution 2 you're making dinosaurs you're doing fossil sites you're researching but you can't do this all at once because your researchers are kind of preoccupied and it kind of puts a like a, a timer uh, but that's one thing that is good about this game is there is a speed up <laughs> option you can also pause the game you can pause it you can play it you could do twice speed or three times the speed either way there's three arrows on that one which is really nice because it negates a lot of the way that can happen in Jurassic World Evolution. Sometimes it's nice to just speed through things. And it would be interesting to see uh, how a speed run, uh, if you can even do a speed run, uh, works. And, you know, maybe implementing the speed up time is a lot better in certain areas. Or, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. One thing, however, and I didn't really think this was going to be an issue, is the faces. Now, I mentioned this in my playthrough that. Why do they look so real? If we just put like a blue filter on all of that, it would look way better on the faces. But hey-ho, the people we've had in the past, they looked real as well. You had, you know, Jeff Goldblum, um, you had Bryce Dallas Howard, but they were all like blue. And the thing is, this, from a stylistic point of view, for me, Everything is blue, and it's still blue in Jurassic World Evolution 2. So why aren't the faces blue? I don't know, it just feels weird. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with inclusivity or anything like that. Just from my perspective, me choosing a researcher has nothing to do with how they look. But Frontier wants it to have something to do with who I choose. It's just something that, I, from an aesthetic perspective, I think they should all just be blue because it just looks nicer. Frontier, I thank you, I think, anyway. But I touched upon, of course, if you have researchers, they need to do jobs. And if they do too many jobs and they have a little experience bar that eventually fills up with a fatigue bar, if they get so far, they may sabotage you. And in the last game, sabotage was just this random thing that was basically for campaigns. And if you, you know, you neglected security enough or, you know, entertainment or science, the three building blocks you had, then one of them might sabotage you. Um, whereas now it kind of feels more earned. It feels more organic that, you know, maybe Maybe you, it's your fault because you've been overworking this specific researcher. Um, and now they're re you know, reacting against you. Um, whereas before it was like, well, I'm just trying to juggle them. Maybe you don't want to put Spinosaurus fighting a T-Rex because that thing cost millions. You're being sabotaged for something that really isn't your fault. Whereas now if you're sabotaged, it's because you've neglected something. So it makes for a more earned bad thing to happen to you, if that makes sense. <laughs> Another thing that happens to you while you play is you have these emergency decisions that appear, or at least that's what I'm calling them. Uh, this happened to me when I released three dinosaurs or four Struthiomimus, and uh, somebody got hurt. Um, it's interesting that this comes into play because this is exactly how Jurassic Park started, with uh, Joffrey being killed by a velociraptor. Ready? Go! and needing to get, you know, the approval of paleontologists and chaoticians uh, to start the park and give it the all clear, which you, we all know how that ended. Uh, you get to choose whether to cover it up or, you know, basically just own up to your mistakes. And each one has their own perks or problems. And depending on what you were going for, it actually has a bearing on the way you play the game. Because for me, I was wanting to save money. Oh no, I was wanting more rating and money didn't really matter. So I wanted to appear, you know, that I was sorry about that. Not as uh, you know, uh, I was not sorry at all. <laughs> I just wanted the rating. 
Um, so I was, I went for the rating kind of thing. But if I needed money, maybe I'd be like, ah, who cares about rating? I need to save money. Um, as well as this, contracts have also updated. So instead of choosing from three or, you know, whatever, four, uh, uh, randomly that pop up because you always need contracts there, monthly, you will choose three of them. And they're kind of passive. So as long as you don't, you know, lose money or you gain more visitors, then you'll get that money and every month it changes, which is nice. That, that feels like you're just kind of looking after your park rather than picking a favorite sort of thing and negates the whole uh you know you need to support this guy more to unlock his perks which apparently doesn't seem to be in the game at the moment and onto something that you've probably wanted to talk about this whole time the dinosaurs themselves Yes, the dinosaurs' behaviors have completely changed, or at least for the most part, from what I've seen, have changed a lot. So let's start with the herbivores. Um, herbivores no longer have well, feeders. Uh, they feed on the forests and trees that you put down. And depending on the dinosaur, they might be, you know, low leaf litter grazing, or they might be high grazers. And depending on how they eat, you might need to put those, um, those types of trees and stuff in there. And really for herbivores, it's not an expense. I, d I, or at least I didn't notice that, you know, I needed to plant more trees, which is always good, but it could be an upkeep and a sort of side of things that's quite interesting to handle. Uh, the social interactions have changed. I noticed that two Nozutoceratops uh, went up to each other and one was biting the other horn, uh, the other one's horn. So it, it kind of felt as though they were more real and breathing rather than just a walking stat bar that I needed to keep happy. They have likes and dislikes as well, uh, which is interesting because in Just World Evolution, going from that, it's just so entrenched in my mind that, well, Triceratops go with pretty much every herbivore. In fact, all herbivores go with each other, but Triceratops and other armored uh, herbivores go with small carnivores. And, you know, you know, large carnivores and small carnivores w can be in the same enclosure, except for a DLC, which made T-Rex and Velociraptor not very happy with each other. <laughs> Now, they have, they're have they very specific with what they like. Nozutoceratops seem to only like ankylosaurs, or ankylosauridia, whatever you want to call them, but then hated pretty much everything else. Stuff like that. So that's interesting. And another one is that you couldn't normally have two types of carnivores in the same enclosure. So if you had a Carnotaurus and an Allosaurus, it would be inevitable they would just kill each other. But now, Carnotaurus and Allosaur actually really like each other. So they're completely fine to be in an enclosure as long as their territory is obtained and they the biggest or uh, I think every, I've said everything's a big change but everything the biggest change but territories um now I didn't get to play with this too much but dinosaurs have territories and even herbivores have their own territories and when a dinosaur is released it kind of takes a while for it to make its territory and you'll notice I noticed that with the the mosasaur as it was swimming along its its territory which seems small starts slowly filling up as it was, you know, swimming around, which is quite nice. Um, and depending on more dinosaurs that get introduced, that territory might grow, grow bigger or might grow smaller. And over time, it's going to change. And you need to keep an eye on that. And that's why you have these ranger stations. And that's why you have these ranger jeeps going around just to keep on checking on things. Otherwise, after a certain period of time, there's no data on the dinosaur. And you don't know how hungry it is, uh, how it likes forests or mountains, or what its territory is like, which is the most important part. Um, so you really need to keep up on that, which is quite nice because normally you would just be able to select anywhere and see what a dinosaur liked or what it didn't like. And speaking of dinosaurs, we got to see the full roster, which seems to be at the moment Nozutoceratops, Amargosaur, Struthimimus, Allosaur, Ankylosaur, Brachiosaur, Conotaurus, Coelophysis, Calamimus, uh, what was it called? Zizanosaurus. Changosaurus. I think it was Stegosaurus, Triceratops, T-Rex, and Velociraptor. Not a great deal difference from the original sort of lineup, but we're getting 70-odd dinosaurs at, this, at launch, and probably a lot more uh, coming up anyway. To touch on buildings, um, now if you remember, you would have clothes shopping malls, or you would have arcades and stuff like that. That's kind of still here with Jurassic World Evolution 2. However, you have small, medium, and large facilities, and depending on you know what's kind of around them in, or your money, that you'll choose which one you really want. Um, however, inside, instead of it just being capacity and price, you have different configure. You have different guests. You have like a general guest. You have like a thrill seeker and stuff like. 
that. Um, now, depending on what's nearby your, your shop, that will influence, and especially with the viewing, influence of uh, viewing platforms, I mean, uh, that will influence who goes there and what the, what the needs are. So when you click on a shop, not only can you customize it, so you can change the colors to an extent, you can also add different um, configurations or modules that they call them interior modules into that shop. So you could add a fish tank, fossil display, fountains, ice cream machines, all these different things. And they increase the happiness of the guests there, basically. The only downside is it doesn't make a difference oh. aesthetically. You can add all these things. You can add a fish tank. You can add a, add a selfie spot if you wanted to. Add that. Aesthetically and visually, it makes no difference, which is a bit of a shame because I think that could have been a, a missed trick there. However, you can configure the way the actual building looks by changing it from Jurassic World aesthetic to Jurassic Park aesthetic and a few little other things here and there, which is quite nice. Decorations, for instance, although it was kind of grayed out. I couldn't click on decorations, so they're probably going to add more. But things as far as rocks are still in the game and they're improved. So a bit like Planet Zoo or any kind of park builder simulator recently within the recent few years, uh, you can rotate them. You can rotate them in different axes and stuff like that. You, however, can't scale them up. It's it's such a shame to see a company like Frontier, who makes games like Planet Zoo, and you can scale them up, and you can clip things inside each other. However, in this game, yes, you can rotate them, but you cannot scale, and they still have a certain vicinity that they need. They can't be within another thing. So you can't put rocks inside of other rocks in order to make something look unique and stuff like that. You can't stack them either. So you're still having the constraints of Jurassic World Evolution, but get to rotate them. Uh, y axis, I think it is. You can rotate them round. <laughs> Not much of a difference it makes, if I've got to be honest. But it's there. And the most anticipated change that came to Jurassic World Evolution two was the introduction to aquatics and if, if playing these games or playing dinosaur games for my whole youtube career has taught me anything it is that people have an insatiable appetite to see aquatic creatures in any dinosaur game and that's why most of them have a dlc or end up updating their game to include aquatics Jurassic Park builder Jurassic world the game Jurassic world live eventually maybe who knows um have this sort of thing eventually happen. It is a big push. So with Jurassic World Evolution, it was thought for a while that aquatics would be in the game, seeing that Mosasaur was kind of the show stealer in the movie, but it never materialized, unfortunately. However, in Jurassic World Evolution 2, you do get aquatics, and that's precisely what I went to do. So let's talk about aquatics. I didn't spend too much time on Avery's because pretty much everything I'm going to say to uh, lagoons and aquatics applies to Pteranodons and Averys. So they all have their unique viewing platforms, a bit like in Jurassic World, the movie, where the platform can go up and down to see the uh, aquatic creatures underwater. You can do the same in here. However, you can have to do it yourself. And from what I've seen, it makes no difference whether it's up or down. If I was just to lower the stand, like let's have a look. So 35, 21, 33, I'll lower the stand. No, doesn't seem to make much of a difference. You also can add fish to your lagoon, as well as a shark feeder with the appropriate research, which, which the Mosasaur can go up and eat, just like in the movie. Um, however, it's kind of like a glorified fish tank, if I can say it, because you put these dinosaurs, or these aquatic reptiles, I should say, into the enclosure, and the two that we could make at the moment was, of course, Mosasaur and a Plesiosaur. They look gorgeous. Um, a lot of the lighting is a bit unfortunate and unfavorable when it comes to the lagoon, um, unless it's broad daylight, you know, with the you have the night and day cycles. Um, you, you don't really get a good view of them, if I'm going to be honest. But when you get that sun streaming in there, they light them up and they look so nice. Um, but they just kind of swim around. Yes, they have the same wants and needs as regular dinosaurs, but they just swim and they don't really do anything. They can't break out that I've noticed. And one thing I was thinking that Frontier could do and could make them a little bit more interesting is that maybe if the lagoon gets damaged or something like that happens and you've got paths going around, maybe they could sort of snap up guests that are walking around. So a police just so could just put out its head and grab a guest or, you know, it's more of a danger that way and something to upkeep. At the moment, the way they are to me, um, as far as if I was to rank dinosaurs, flyers, and aquatics, aquatics are quite low on the list of things that um, are going to be interesting long term. Because with dinosaurs, they can break out, they can do all this stuff. And to a point, and I haven't really tested or seen it, Avery's 
of course, can break out. Oh, Sarandons can break out of the Avery's. And there are, especially with the main menu, there does seem to be something about Sarandons not just flying off into the distance like they used to, but actually attacking guests or even attacking dinosaurs, meaning that you might have to dart them. And maybe they'll attack your helicopters and stuff, which would be so cool. I mean, you know, helicopter for the most part is invulnerable to all the dinosaurs because either they had a hitbox around them so you couldn't go into a Brachiosaur's neck or it can't just reach them. Uh, maybe a T-Rex would be able to if you flew, flew low enough, and I don't know whether that's something they're going to implement. But a Pteranodon is in the sky, so it would make sense that a Pteranodon would be able to attack the helicopter, right? Another thing, Frontier, just, I'm just giving you all these ideas. Please use them, please do. It would be so cool to see that. And something I wanted to mention about challenge mode when I loaded it up, Cabot Finch said that they take a close look around this area. There might be some that could draw in the guests. So, depending on what you what mode you play, um, especially with challenge mode, there might be a case of you having to take out a ranger vehicle and find the you know the breadcrumbs in order to see a dinosaur that you might need to heal and tranquilize and transport to an enclosure you make and therefore save you a lot of money researching it. And that way, it kind of makes that dinosaur more important because you've got it and you can't fix it or you can't make it again. So you don't have the dig sites, you haven't researched the fossils and stuff like that. So this thing, if it goes, if it dies, it's gone. So that's a really cool, unique idea that I didn't even think about. But when I was, you know, told that you might be able to go out and collect dinosaurs and stuff, I was like, uh, just a bit like Jurassic World Evolution when all of a sudden it was like, you've got a Diplodocus coming in 15 minutes, make an enclosure. But this way, especially in a challenge mode that you want to get to five stars as quickly as possible or something like that, it has quite a big bearing and you want to keep that thing alive because it's saving money and money that could go towards something else. So let's talk about the animations. No, 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 no. <laughs> They can either look really good, or they can look weird. You can have the Carnotaurus doing some weird crab walk towards you, where it's not even looking at you and it's going towards you. Or the same with the Nozudoceratops, and you get some weird animations. And I can understand why this is happening, because it's trying to go somewhere, and it's sort of fading into different animations to do so. Uh, but it's, all, its body's already moving, its head hasn't even started, but its legs are already off. 100 miles in that direction, so the rest is playing catch-up. Um, and it's quite interesting to see the Contouros and the Allosaur have to chase a goat and kind of line that up, but I think myself I would prefer that kind of animation rather than the regular, you know, sort of pivoting and they sort of do like a couple of steps on the spot to line themselves up while they slowly turn around and then the animation starts. It kind of just makes it more alive. And again, this is a development build. They're probably going to change some things. Things are still being worked on. And you never know, we might see a more polished version of that. But as far as animation goes, with the social interaction, I saw uh, two Carnotauruses sort of battling each other. And that's another thing. Dinosaurs have a lot of stats. I mean, we used to have the attack and defense stats that we're, we're used to. But now you've got base dominance, you've got stamina, which I'm assuming has to do with battles. So maybe one dinosaur dinosaur has more stamina than the other and if it you know if it's able to last longer it'll be able to defeat that other dinosaur and stuff like that you've got diet you've got, you've got metabolism there if i can say that word resilience which we've we've come to expect expect a lifespan age status check which is the new thing that the jeeps do uh, and health recovery which is always something we speculated at it always felt like in the other game just world evolution interrupter healed faster than most dinosaurs or acrocanthosaurus healed faster than other dinosaurs so now we actually have a stat for that so that seems like something that in the genetics, in the health category, would be able to change. Not only do you have kills and fights recorded, but you also have fence broken and scars, which is the new thing. I think we always had fences broken or breakouts or something like that. But scars could be quite interesting. So I think if I played the campaign, the Allosaur had some scars and some fractures. So if it gets to full health, would those heal over? And that way, not only is it just, you know, an Allosaur, it's the scarred Allosaur. You know, it has a story to tell behind it. You know, we all the kids love blue because it's a Velociraptor, yes, but it's got a blue stripe. There's a personality. And is this something we're going to see with other dinosaurs? There's been lots of battles. Oh, that's that scarred T-Rex. You know, like old one-eye. Although that's a Warhammer reference, but you, you get what I mean. But it's safe to say that after playing Jurassic World Evolution 2, a lot of my worries and apprehension is kind of put at bay. I think it's filled with 
a few more, a few new ones, a bit like the researchers. Um, uh, again, it's it's something that I personally didn't see take too much effect when I was playing the game. And let's not even talk about that. You needed to research the rest area, so you might have you might have scientists that are absolutely knackered and are about to sabotage and need to rest, but you can't rest them because they need to research a bed to sleep in, apparently. Which is a little bit weird if it comes to think of it. But apart from a few qualms that I have, especially with the lagoons, because I think Avery's, I mean, I didn't get to see the Pteranodon on the Morphodon, but you know, I've seen them in plenty of other games. Um, and especially that we've had Avery's in the past with Jurassic World Evolution. It was nice to play around with the lagoons, get to see that, like how that works a little bit more. Um, a lot of creatures may May not be able to mix with each other. Please just could mix with Mosasaur, for instance. They were panicking the whole time. However, I didn't see any get eaten. So maybe the Mosasaur's fed it works, but they're just not happy. I don't know. Maybe people won't like that. But it has been a lovely experience to play this. Um, and I'm even more excited to see just what happens in the future with the environment damage stuff, the snow storms and things like that, and all these different things that can happen. But if you enjoyed this video, Leave a like, tell me what your thoughts are on Jurassic World Evolution 2. What are you most hyped for? What are your concerns, maybe grievances that you've had with maybe my footage or, you know, somebody else who's played the game who showed different stuff? Uh, leave that all down in the comments below. I'd love seeing your thoughts and maybe responding to a few of them. And until next time, I'll see you cuties later. Oh, bye-bye.